Welcome to the T-Space Anwender Treffen 2020. Um, as you all know, there are circumstances that made it uh, necessary to make this as a webinar and not as an in-person meeting. We are trying to um, organize an in-person meeting on 1st and 2nd of October in Berlin. Currently, we cannot say if that will be possible, but that's what we are going to try and we have to see how the situ situation develops. Um, we are coming to our first talk in English today. It will be given by Tom Linnum. I hope I pronounced your name right um, from Archivum. It's an important topic um, that is always asked by, by, by persons who are looking for the first time on repositories. It's about long time archiving. And Tom will present how um, they, uh, how Archivum is, is interacting with DSpace in terms of long time archiving. Tom, please go ahead. Great, thank you very much, Pascal, and uh, thank you for having me uh, in today to talk. Um, so over the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be looking to cover a general overview of uh, what digital preservation is um, and what digital safeguarding is, why it's important um, and why we need to care about it. I'll then quickly run through Archivum's Perpetua solution and uh, spend most of the time on how that integrates with something like um, DSpace. Um, I'll quickly cover a little bit about how one of our users is, is using both solutions. Um, and then, as Pascal mentioned as well, I'll finish up uh, with some questions as well. Um, before, though, I do um, get into the meeting session, I thought it worth spending uh, a couple of moments just to introduce myself and, and archive them. Um, so, as you can see, that's, that's me on the screen. Um, my name is Tom Lynham. Uh, I am the marketing manager at Archivum, and I've been in the role since the beginning of the year. Um, my background is in both product management and marketing. Um, I've had over 10 years experience working in a range of different industries, um, from technology providers to IP uh, management consultants, um, and also a little bit in professional education. Um, and last year I actually lived and worked in Australia before returning to the UK from where I'm now um, speaking to you today. Um, I must apologise as well for not being able to give this presentation in German, but I assure you, you will understand much more of it with me speaking English than me attempting to speak in German. Um, that said, if I am speaking too quickly, um, then please do um, let uh, Pascal know and I will endeavour to slow down a little. In terms of who Archivum are, um, we're a hosted solution uh, for long-term data management, archiving and digital preservation. We were founded in 2011 um, and focused on very much the storage of research data. We actually originally came out of the uh, University of Southampton um, and we've evolved since then to around 20 staff um, based across the UK and the US. You'll see that we have um, quite a range of different customers and that initial use case of storing research data has expanded um, over those years um, into things like farmer and life sciences, heritage organisations and, and libraries as well. Um, and you'll also notice um, EBSCO's uh, logo in the bottom left of the screen who are one of our um, main partners and um, are um, partly responsible for, for putting us forward to speak today. Um, so a thank you to them as well. Okay, so thank you for your patience as I went through those very quick introductions um, and hopefully providing a little bit of context to who I am and who Archivum are. Um, but let's now jump into the main, main topic of uh, today. Um, so before I talk in any detail about safeguarding or digital preservation, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of long-term data management and how it differs to a simple backup. Um, sometimes it's easier to describe something by stating what it's not, and none of the solutions on the screen really come under the banner of effective long-term data management. They can all back up data, um, but long-term data management is something slightly different. Um, physical storage is often easily corrupted over time um, or not secure enough. Um, and if we think on a personal level, um, how many of us have backed up um, old files or pictures 
onto one of these devices and either ended up losing them or um, that they are, they in some way become corrupted. I think myself, I have about three or four different storage accounts from uh, major providers online, um, each with their own libraries and collections of pictures, um, all sort of linked to various devices I had at, at this um, at various times. And this really doesn't just apply to the individual. Um, there's also numerous uh, examples of organizations falling foul to this as well. Um, I actually recently uh, wrote a blog which was published this week, um, highlighting three cases, um, quite public cases of organizations who lost data um, because they thought um, they had a very robust long-term data management strategy or, or a backup of some sort. Um, so it includes things like 90% uh, of the movie Toy Story 2 being accidentally deleted, um, episodes of Doctor Who being deleted by the BBC, um, and also a very recent case of NASA um, and an issue they have with cloud storage with AWS and actually accessing that data. Um, I won't go into detail um, with any of those, but if you, you are interested, I can share the link to that, that blog um, afterwards. I do quite like the um, quote on the screen from Stanford University's uh, website, um, and I think it really hits the nail on the head when it comes to long-term management of data. Um, many assume that it's simply backing up your data to a device or a cloud, as, as we've said, and this isn't the case. Um, you know, as we've discussed, files can get corrupted over time. Um, there's actually a recently published report from Forrester about digital fragility, which gives some good examples in there. Um, in terms of corruption of data on physical physical files, um, they were, uh, they've lost. Uh, they give the example of lost photos from digital photos from 9/11 Ground Zero. So obviously, very valuable data lost because it wasn't properly managed. Um, and also formats change over time. So that same report highlights a couple of examples. Uh, one, a UK cultural institution which lost data that it couldn't migrate from old versions of PowerPoint um, and a large bank which lost 20 years worth of mortgage documents for its customers. So obviously really important documents for, for both those organisations. And I'm not trying to scare anyone here, but I think if there's one thing that you do take from the session today, it'd be not to take long-term um, management of your data for granted and understand that it, it is more to it than just having a backup. So now if I shift um, and uh, talk in a little bit more detail around um, firstly digital safeguarding and then a little bit about digital preservation. And I think it's easy to jump straight to security when we talk of safeguarding, but there's actually a lot more to it. Um, I'll talk through a couple of the examples of how um, or conversations we have with customers here, but this really does apply to, to everyone. Um, so firstly, um, it's really important to avoid siloed data. Having data located in multiple locations can make it very challenging to access and use um, data effectively. And it's actually one of the first conversations we have with most of our customers about understanding where all their data sources are and bringing them together. The second is making sure that they're securely stored, having that peace of mind that they're safe, um, immutable, secure and available um, when needed. Um, we've already covered um, making sure there's no data leakage or degradation um, and making sure that that data is being constantly checked, that it's, um, it's still valid and, and available. I think as well, another thing that a lot of our, our customers and potential customers talk about very early on is the accessibility and the ability to migrate that data. Um, and it's something that we're very keen to ensure that our customers understand that it's their data, not it doesn't suddenly become our data. So it's that ability to access and have control over your own data. Um, then, we need to consider um, secure data access. So making sure that the right users have access to the, to the right data that they should and can manage the right data. And then finally, um, making sure that you have 100% confidence when it comes to meeting regulatory compliance requirements. Although this is more applicable to some than others, I think with recent changes um, in laws, I say recent, but things like GDPR coming in, anyone who's sort of responsible for managing data needs to be aware of, of these requirements and also making sure that um, 
that they're keeping up with those latest requirements as well. If we move now to, sorry, I'm just flashing up. Okay, sorry. Um, so if we move now to digital preservation um, and the second major part um, that I wanted to talk about today, um, in preparing for this presentation, um, I wanted to try and find out how many different uh, file formats exist in the world at the moment. Um, it was actually a very difficult task. If anyone does know um, a more accurate number than this, then please do let me know in the chat. Um, but when all else failed, I, I went to Wikipedia, um, so I do apologise. Um, but on their main site in terms of file formats, there's over 1600 listed. And I think over the coming years, this will only continue to grow um, and will, it will be a, an issue and a challenge for organisations which isn't going anywhere. When storing data for many years, digital preservation is crucial to ensuring the long term accessibility. And I think as we begin to see more and more born digital content, um, it's only going to be something which increases as, um, as we go further into the future. Now, one of the most mis uh, common misconceptions um, that we come across is that a, a backup is good enough for digital preservation. And I've kind of already touched on this um, earlier in the session um, and that having a backup is effectively digitally preserving your data. Um, and whilst in many cases this is the cheaper option, um, it will cost organisations in the long run. Um, and I think that becomes clear when we look at sort of the detail of what actually digital pres preservation is. And there's three main ingredients um, to this, which is accessibility, usability and searchability. And all are crucial to ensuring that your data can be accessed for the long term. So if I first look at usability of data, um, you need to ensure that those files are um, still available as formats evolve. Um, and if we think back to those two examples I gave earlier around the mortgage data and um, the uh, data on uh, PowerPoint, you know, that, that's something that all of us use almost on a daily basis. The second is searchability of the data. So it's important to consider everything about the associated metadata and making sure that that's properly recorded. Um, in a normal backup, you could potentially go in and edit individual files metadata, but this isn't really sustainable for the long term or, or at any type of scale. Um, and what you need to consider is whether it's possible to actually search through your data so you can find what you're actually looking for out of your whole archive. There's no point just having um, <laughs> having the data safe and secure if you can't actually find what you need further down the line. And then finally, it's about the accessibility. Um, and as, as we've already discussed, there's a number of challenges about accessing um, your data on, on sort of traditional concepts of, of backup when we've taken the possibility of things like corruption or data degradation. Um, and I think the final point to make here is um, in terms of digital pr preservation, it's about the ongoing nature of it. Um, it's not something that you can do once and, and you're good. It's, um, it's a complex process of actually actively managing multiple files over time to ensure that future access. Okay, um, so that's digital safeguarding and digital preservation. Um, I now want to switch tack a little and talk about Petra and, and how it integrates into, into the DSpace um, environment. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail here because I, I'm, I'm not here to sell Perpetua to you. Um, but what, what it does do is, is offers users the ability to manage um, their data for the long term. Um, so it can be uploaded into our system or ingested into our system. Um, and we have users who are um, looking at a, a couple of years through to anything um, much longer than that. Um, it's also... Tom, sorry. Yep. So, sorry to interrupt you, but you're close to the end of your speaking time. You can continue, of course, for some minutes, but it will yeah. reduce the type of question and answers. Okay, I'll, um, I'll make sure I uh, speed through the last couple of slides then. Um, and um, obviously, I'm more than happy to have a follow up conversation with anyone who would be interested to talk more about that after the session. Um, we also integrate into a number of different systems. Um, 
Petra itself isn't open source, um, but as you can see, um, we do integrate to a whole range of different solutions. Um, and now this is really um, where I wanted to spend uh, the last couple of minutes really um, talking about the workflow of the integration between DSpace and Perpetua. Uh, so on the screen, this is a typical workflow um, where DSpace is being used as a, a repository um, solution for research data and publications and, and how it would integrate into something like Perpetua. Um, so if we look at the sort of the first six steps, that's um, a sort of fairly standard um, use of DSpace. You have a researcher who's depositing data into DSpace. Um, you have a review and approval processes um, and, and various different um, outputs are created from that. Um, where Petua really enters is at step seven. Um, and it's at this point that um, that work, that research data or publications that need um, preserving and safeguarding um, come into play. So through the integration between um, the repository and Perpetua, the work is copied over to the system. So it can go through an automated preservation process. Um, Perpetua then creates uh, what we call a, an AIP or an archival information package that holds the data set, the metadata, and any long-term uh, data preservation derivatives created by the Perpetua system. And then the AIP is replicated and stored in multiple geographic locations um, and undergoes those regular fixity checks to make sure that it's still there and available. Um, and then finally, DSpace is notified that um, the preservation is complete so that the librarian and or researcher knows that the data set is fully safe. So I think the key thing here about this workflow is that the researcher and the administrator continue to use the repository um, using sort of their normal day-to-day um, -day practices. Um, and the preservation element is embedded into these work throws through that integration. And it happens automatically without um, those using the system aware of it. Now, beyond that final point, um, depending on the way that DSpace is being used, it may be that the original copy of the data set in DSpace is actually removed entirely. And if a user wants to access that data again, um, particularly if it's been there for, for, for many years, it can then contact Perpetua and to pull that, a copy of that data um, and be restored um, back into DSpace um, to deliver it to the user. And this is actually what happens with um, uh, a DSpace user and a Perpetua customer um, in the University of Hertfordshire. Um, uh, finally, um, there's not too much to say here. Um, I just wanted to share a quick um, uh, anecdote around uh, a new Perpetua customer who is also a DSpace uh, user at the University of Zululand in South Africa. Um, and they, they will be following a very similar workflow um, that I just ran through. Um, they have their content in DSpace, including special collections and archives. Uh, and they want a copy sent from DSpace to Perpetua for safeguarding um, and preservation. And it will also be um, surfaced through uh, Atom as well. Um, I would like to share a little bit more about that, but um, at the moment I sadly can't. Um, but uh, yeah, I would sort of watch this space and hopefully we can share a little bit more detail about that in, in the future. So um, thank you um, very much for your time. Uh, apologies for going over a little bit. Um, and uh, if we do have any questions, that, that would be great. Um, my one caveat is um, I'm, not a, I'm not in a technical role at Archivum. Um, I will endeavor to answer any questions that I can. Um, any that I can't, I will uh, make sure that we take away and get someone from our team to um, get an answer and uh, share that back with the group. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, well, you said you're not technical, so we're probably not going to uh, give you any technical questions. <laughs> um, I, I really have to say I had expected a little bit more about DSpace and the connection, some technical details. So it's, uh, I think we're all sure that digital preservation is um, a hot topic and we need to address it at DSpace. Um, are there any questions? Uh, you can uh, put them into the uh, 
Frage and Antworten down on the, below the screen. And oh, we have a first question. Um, Tom, can you present or add some examples how it looks like if data is stored in Perpetua? Okay, um, so in terms of um, in, in terms of so if someone was uploading data to Perpetua, um, there there is a dashboard um, which provides various information um, according to permissions, audit trails, all that sort of stuff. So there's that sort of visualization um, in terms of how it's actually um, stored. Um, there, there's a lot of different options depending on requirements. Um, we, we offer sort of, uh, various different cloud options on premise um, and, and anything stored in the cloud, there's multiple different locations that that can be stored. So it really kind of depends on um, what the requirement is of the, of the user. Um, and, and the, the perpetual solution is very um, flexible um, to, to deliver that. And are there any examples you can give? Um, when, in terms of examples, there's, I mean, there's a number of use cases and, and case studies on, on our website. I'm not sure in terms of the, I mean, I can, I can show some screenshots, which I could pull, um, if, if that would be useful, but I, in terms of sort of having, uh, you know, we've got a number of, from, from the logos you saw on the screen, well, there's a number of different, um, I could add the question was or was more specific. Uh, could you add some examples from repositories, especially of course these space, but it could be others as well. Um, you have the uh, I think African South African. Yeah, the South University of Zululand. Yeah. I mean, I, sorry, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. I mean, in, ter in terms of the how that would look in terms of the workflow. Um, that was the previous slide. Um, you know that that's that's you know how it how it looks. The the perpetua system integrates into DSpace, so it would depend very much on what um, the the setup, the customer setup and requirement for that storage would look like. Okay, then I'd like to proceed to, to the next question. It's, is the process carried out by humans or machines, algorithms? Um, so it's, it's all done um, automatically. Um, so the, the, the sort of user interaction would be um, the data manager um, or whoever's fulfilling that role within an organization sort of uploading or ingesting data into the system. Um, and then uh, and there would be fair sort of a number of different settings and options that they would have when they upload that. But in terms of the storage, the digital preservation and all of that, that's all conducted automatically um, by, like I said, by our um, algorithms. Oh, sorry, in terms of the preservation process. Yeah, so the, the preservation process um, is automatic. Um, in in sort of simple terms, uh, when files are uploaded, um, they will be reformatted to a, a smaller number of formats, um, and that this is all conducted automatically. Um, and then those formats are updated on an ongoing basis. So um, when a format evolves that is stored within Perpetua, it will automatically um, update to that latest version of that format and that's all done automatically. All right, thank you. That answers the question about the preservation process. And we have one more question. This is um, whether the perpetual, the flow from Perpetua to DSpace is only via import from the AIP stored in Perpetua or is there a Perpetua format uh, or, or an alerting mechanism? Um, so that one I would have to take away. I can check that with the team right. um, to see what, what was possible there. But um, yeah, I can, I can check that. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, we'll have a break for about five minutes and we're going to stop the recording.